Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first installment, our inaugural segment of our YouTube Potluck Leadership Luncheons. And we're going to spend some time with some incredible people from our community and from the community abroad to talk leadership coaching, get a sense of their story and how uh, they're navigating the, some of the waters that we're dealing with uh, from our leadership and a coaching and just a life uh, living perspective as well. And uh, and gain some insight and learn a couple of things as well along the way. So uh, when we put our roster together of our, our potential speakers, this gentleman's name was first on the list. Uh, we actually connected years ago, 2007, when he uh, came here to the, the nation's capital, Ottawa, as a police chief. And I had launched a, a part, uh, foundation, a breast cancer foundation program called the 100 Man Run. And his support with the OPS team was uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely made uh, us a very a great success. And uh, we'll forever be grateful for that support that we received from him. And that is, of course, uh, former police chief of, of here in the nation's capital, Ottawa, and that is Vern White. Vern, thanks for joining us. Hey, Ken, how are you, man? You know what? Nobody looked better in pink than you did, I have to tell you. You know what? And it was such a great time. We stopped traffic. It was a great time. Uh, we raised money for a great cause. And uh, it was indicative of your leadership style in a lot of ways, and and uh, uh, and, and I don't think I don't think it was a far stretch from what Vince Bevan brought to the table at the time. But at the same time, you had your own unique way of connecting with the community. We want to get into that. But for those who don't know you, let's get into your history first off. Sure. Now, were you born in New Waterford? I was born in New Waterford, Cape Breton Island. Yeah, well, tough, okay, uh, coal so, mining town. Unlike Sarah Palin, who can see Russia from her window, <laughs> you could on good days you can probably see Newfoundland. Could you not? You could. Ninety kilometers across, you could see it. Yeah. Now the closest major city would be Sydney, or would yeah, it be Sydney yeah, would have been home the of the Cape Breton Screaming Eagles. Yeah. yeah. Now you grew up there. What was that like for you? Like, well, look, look. And how did it lead to you becoming an officer? Well, look, I grew up in a, it was a rough coal mining town, 9,000 people, 50 bars, two restaurants, no hotels, you know, like, so, you know, my dad was a coal miner 38 years, in fact, died from black lung. And I think he put in most of them, uh, my family, as most of my friends were, the, the willingness to work hard, um, for the most case, uh, for the uh, most part, just to continue to have a life to live. Yeah. I don't think most of us ever thought you'd get ahead much further than that. So uh, I never really had thought about being a police officer. Most of my friends uh, went to jail. Um, I had been uh, picked up a couple of times for, as a, a youth for drinking and fighting. Of course, my first ride alongs weren't great ones. They're in the back seat, not the front. <laughs> I was a bartender at 20 and uh, two cops used to come in on a Friday night. And one of the guys uh, said, uh, you should do a ride along. And I reminded him of the early ride alongs that didn't go great. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, seriously, come on out. So I went out, I did hundreds of hours of ride alongs. I couldn't believe there was a job out there that would let you impact on people's lives right. so dramatically in such a short period of time. And I applied for the RCMP and after a couple of years, apparently it takes a couple of years for them to forgive the early ride alongs. I uh, was successful and joined the RCMP at 22. Now, when you went to the RCMP, uh, you would have done your 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 college in Regina. Yeah, I was Regina, Saskatchewan. Okay. Uh, once you live there six months, everywhere else in the country is easy. Well, because I was drafted by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, so I had an experience <laughs> of living in Regina for a couple of months, and uh, it was a, a great city, a different city. But then you went from Regina, and you, they usually test your metal by posting you in armpit British Columbia, as far north as you can go. Uh, where did you end up when you left uh, RCMP at uh, Police College? I went to Stephenville, Newfoundland, a small uh, fishing okay. community on the West Coast for a couple of years. And then I went north uh, for the next 19 years, um, served in all three territories um, from Iqaluit, Lake Harbor, Inuvik, Aklavik, Yellowknife twice, Whitehorse. So I traveled back and forth across the north between 1984 and 2003 until I, uh, I left the Nunavut as the commanding officer of the RCMP and I came to Ottawa as an assistant commissioner in 2003. And then eventually you ended up at Durham and you came back to Ottawa and you ended up with the Ottawa Police Force as chief. Now, through that time, was it your goal to be become a chief to take on that leadership role? Uh, that no, you know what? Page? Not, not really. My goal always was to be uh, 
someone that they look to to get things done. So yeah. I really, you know, and I was lucky in many ways. And some of my promotions earlier on, I was in uh, the primary investigator of an investigation in Yellowknife called the Giant Mine Task Force, where we had nine gold miners murdered during an explosion, uh, killed by a striking miner. So I had some lucky investigations that kind of got me into places I wouldn't have got into otherwise. But I really never saw myself ever taking on a role as chief. In fact, uh, probably the most fun I ever had was as a constable or a corporal. Um, you know, it becomes the things you love to do the most, you get to do the least, the higher up you went, it seemed sure. like. Yeah. Um, not saying I didn't enjoy, I, I loved being the police chief. Ottawa is a great city to be police chief in, primarily because the public um, want you to connect with them. Right. Look, it's a city of public servants, right? So when they see you, they see you as their servant and they want you to connect with them and explain to them, what are you doing and why you're doing it? Yeah. Not necessarily agree. And in fact, I think you'll probably remember I had asked the chief TV show with uh, Sandra Blakey mm -hmm. for a while and yeah. the public would call in and probably half the time they weren't happy with my response, but they would hear a response. And that's what they were actually wanting to know is what's going on. Are you going to start or you're going to stop doing something and you would tell them whether you were or not and be transparent and i think that's what the public internally uh, when we deal with them but the public uh, uh, or sorry externally but the public internally to an organization as well expect you to be transparent they don't always want you to, to agree they want you to make a decision uh, that's articulated and if they disagree they want to be able to tell you they disagree and then move on the organization has things to do and I want to segue that to leadership and, and you, know, you had a large team with the auto police, uh, but you also had a team in terms of the community at large. And uh, I've learned that uh, authenticity, whether it's good news or bad news being delivered is key to the message being accepted. Now, the person may not like what you have to say. Uh, I remember Joe Pow Pow telling me this when he had to release guys at the end of training camp. And these were guys who were just on the bubble, close to making the team, but they weren't qu quite good enough. And a lot, of those were, a lot of those athletes were seeing their dreams being dashed because that was going to be the last stop in terms of their football career. And to be able to explain, honestly, with that sense of transparency and authenticity, that this is the reason why. And uh, he had said that he gives every athlete a mark of A going into training camp. Now, if you end up at a D, uh, you'll know because you've been coached up and you've been informed and you've been given plenty of chances. So there's no surprise when you're asked to bring your playbook into the room. And, and I guess what I want to ask you is messaging and authentic messaging. So not just uh, say something, but follow it up by actual. Yeah. Uh, Joanne Pollock used to say, uh, don't tell me, show me. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. You know, if you look back uh, when I first came here, one of my first meetings with a number of community members who had identified the lack of drug treatment resources for youth right. in the community, right? As a perfect right. example. And my, my, I always say I'm a simple guy from Cape Breton. How hard is this? If we have 430 kids on a wait list for drug treatment, right. well, let's do something about that and build a drug treatment center. And they all laughed at me and, and said, well, I'll, you know, we've been saying that for 20 years, Vern, we're not getting there. So when I called the premier's office and he wouldn't take my phone call, I was actually quite surprised that the premier wouldn't have the same concerns I had because the whole community cared about it, right? So at that point, you could have easily stepped away. But even the organization, because I had been talking about it for a couple of months, the membership were saying, yeah, you're right. You know, we have 15-year-old kids committing sex acts for a rock of crack cocaine in the market and we're taking them to children's aid and then home like yeah. we need to do something about this so the question then from everybody is how much are you willing to do so when we call w5 and said come into a show called the crack capital of canada yeah. and we will call out the government for not doing something about this i think people were surprised but and I would argue, uh, and I, Dalton McGinty probably as upset as he was at me when we did that. Afterwards, I think would have said that he recognizes that we felt there was nothing else we could do. We had run run into too many roadblocks. We mm -hmm. had to take the top of the hill now, and if somebody knocks us off, they knock us off. And we were lucky enough that the premier, to be fair to him, uh, recognized that if it was that big a thing that we, some of us, were willing to lose our job over, then it had to be something he had to step into. And he, he did step into it. He provided continuous funding for two drug treatment centers. And then we went out and raised over $20 million in the community 
to build drug treatment centers and put drug treatment counselors in 57 high schools. And today it's the only city in the country that has that, the support of United Way, of course, uh, successfully. But because the whole community said, yeah, you know what, it's that important. Let's do that. Uh, Not because Vern White said it. I couldn't have done it on my own. What's interesting, though, is it reminds me of that whole idea. Of, uh, I remember a, a coach telling me that he had this great athlete, physically had all the tools, but just un- was uncoachable. And my, my, my first thought wasn't about, well, geez, this kid's missing out on an opportunity. My thought was, from a coaching standpoint, maybe the missed opportunity was there and that you didn't figure out a way to coach this kid up. And, and, and maybe in, in a roundabout way, the province didn't figure out a way because they've been so sort of narrow in their thinking and maybe a little myopic and not looking for options that were outside of the box to try mm-hmm. to solve the solution. You showed up and you said, you know, simple guy from Cape Breton, but maybe sometimes you need to step out and simplify things and get back to the foundation of relationship building and, yeah. and connecting on that personal level. You know, you, know, you mentioned the, the kids and what they were doing. It's just, you, know, you say, oh, yeah, we, we, we may need a drug treatment center, but give us a reason why. And you can give them statistics, but if you say, okay, we got a 15 year old who's, who's committing these acts just to get, a, 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 again, a crack cocaine, then you say, well, geez, then you start visualizing that could be someone I know, that could be my child somewhere down the road. So you personalize that. So then people are more apt to have a personal investment, some skin in the game. Well, you know, I've given a talk, it's about a 25 minute talk, yeah, 700 times. In, in the city, right? right. Um, a lot of the times for United Way and fundraising. And I talk about, you know, what it's like for a parent to, um, you know, sleep outside their 15 year old son's door because if they don't in the middle of the night, he's gonna run away stealing what he can on the way out the door to sell it so he can buy some crack cocaine and use it that night. And then the police bring him back in the morning and this continuous groundhog day. Mm-hmm. And there's not a crowd of more than 15 people that I've given that talk to that not at least one person in that room can tell you about that lived experience. Yeah. Yeah, they've never told that story. So for them, you become their voice. And that's what I kept hearing from people in the city is that, you know what, you become, you become our voice about this tragedy that nobody seems to care about. And I don't believe nobody cared. I believe mm-hmm. they didn't understand. And the minute you made it understandable, then it, all of a sudden they care. Uh, and I had a firsthand experience because I was working in group homes with young guys. And we had to lock their running shoes and their ski jackets up, their winter jackets up, because they'd steal each other stuff to sell that. So they get down the market and pick up their drugs. And yeah. it was, it was a, from the outside looking in and getting a sense of what these kids were going through. And obviously there were a lot of other variables, lack of parenting, lack of role models. And 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 they're just they've been they've been asked to make decisions, significant life decisions on their own with no real experience. And they're so they were doomed to fail in a lot of ways. And and a lot of times the boys would stay in because they, they want me to sort of regale them with football stories because they, they never had gotten that sort of that male yeah. role model story. And then to remind them that, you know, I was just a guy growing up downtown Ottawa. I could have easily gone that direction. Like a lot of my buddies have, like a lot of your buddies had. Yeah, that's and, right. And that they're not destined to follow that path. They don't have to buy into that, that, that destiny. Well, in the, in the path of life, there's multiple off-roads. Some yeah. of them are very good and some of them are very bad. Understanding which off-roads to take sometimes requires someone to direct traffic. You know, skip this one. You don't need to do this one. Let's move on to the next off-road. And I think, you know, where you grew up, uh, where I grew up, and, and to be fair, I think it's a Canadian thing mm-hmm. that anybody can be anything. I, I truly believe, unlike most countries, that it's true in this country. I, I think the fact that we've had you and I have been lucky enough to have some good people in our lives to help us yeah. navigate that path has been helpful, but not every, not every young person out there has that. That's why I think organizations, the boys and girls club, big brothers, big sisters, uh, I think bring that opportunity for some form of mentorship. And I don't like using that word because it tends to be overused, mm-hmm. but that mentorship, which is sometimes just shaping people as they're moving along that path. And I've had, look, I've had 50 mentors and not one of them formally ever. But yeah. I've had at least 50 mentors, somebody who has helped me deliver something else the next time because they were there and cared about me often, right? They cared about me being successful or doing better than I was doing or getting good at what I wanted to be good at. So there you are, police chief here in Ottawa in a role, a very responsible role, lots, lots to take on. And uh, it seems like for the last 20 years now, the OPS has been always in transition from chief to chief. 
Uh, what was the greatest challenge for you from a leadership perspective and getting people to buy into your vision and where you want to sort of see the direction of OPS go? I think probably the, the greatest uh, challenge would have been uh, in how we were going to manage the issues in the market, particularly from a drug addiction perspective, because I was arguing that we needed drug treatment centers, uh, which nobody would disagree with, but not everybody agreed it was our child. It was our challenge, right? It's a health issue. So then taking the rest of that package around building a street crime unit that was going to target drug traffickers hit hard in certain parts of the community. I mean, I think in one 30 day period, our, our, our street crime unit arrested over a hundred traffickers. <clears throat> and, and part of that was so that we were sending the messages across the spectrum that we weren't forgiving drug trafficking. Yeah. We were going to target drug trafficking because we were taking advantage of often people who were um, they're very vulnerable addicts. At the same time, we're trying to raise money to build drug treatment centers to deal with those addicts and get them into treatment. Mm -hmm. So I think explaining that message across the organization, now many can say, well, how do you do that? It's 2,000 people. And I can tell you there wasn't a platoon meeting I didn't go to. There wasn't a unit meeting I didn't go to. There wasn't a function I didn't go to. Mm -hmm. You have to tell that story about that we're going to hit multiple parts of this problem all at the same time for us to be successful. I remember doing town hall meetings in Vanier or, or Lower Town or Centre Town, right. uh, doing those town hall meetings where people were screaming all kinds of different issues. There's prostitutes in front of my house, there's drug traffickers every morning, uh, they're stealing my lawn furniture and selling it. And, and you want to hear all those discussions and then you want to tell them two or three things that you were going to ensure the organization targeted. Yeah. And in our case, you know, we were targeting Vanier, a place that I love. I have to tell you, I believe it in many ways is the soul of the city. Mm -hmm. As many challenges as it, have, it has had, it still has many people who have grown up there and believe in that community. You know, I remember the first couple of times we would do the 100 plus arrests, two thirds of them would come from that area. Yeah. And myself, Mike Flanagan, Ed Keeley and Jill Arishel and others would show up down there with brooms and sweep the streets. Not because we were going to clean the streets, but we wanted to send them a message that we were going to do everything we could to do to help that community be everything they could be. Whether it was opening a farmer's market in a bank parking lot on a Saturday, probably without a permit, I think, if I remember back. It didn't matter. Our goal was to try and make the whole community have a better chance of having a better life, not just do what we used to call police work, which is arresting bad guys. For that to happen, though, then somewhere along the way, you had to close the gap and eliminate the idea that it's your problem and I'm going to come and solve it and, and turn into this is an our problem. And if I'm a police chief or a leader of any salt of, worth any you know, value, then I have to be there. 100 percent right. on, on the ground in yeah. that community doing ride alongs with Roly Campbell. And he's telling me about how we need to do something to get better at it. Well, let's do that. What does it take? Policy changes. Okay, tomorrow is a day we'll get new policy in place if that's what it takes. So it's getting the membership moving forward and getting people that are trusted. You know, the Samir Bartnagars, uh, Roly Campbell, Jill LaRochelle, like, yeah. all those folks who are on the ground, Mike Flanagan's, get them moving so that the membership under them who trusted them, because they didn't know me and nor should they trust me. They didn't know me but trusted them that we were going to move in the right direction and then getting out into that community and telling them we're hearing you. We may not agree with you and may not do everything you want, yeah. but we're going to do these things as well as we possibly can to make your life better. Right. I mean, building a farmer's market in Vanier is an example where um, a number of people at a town hall said, we need a farmer's market. Everybody has a farmer's market. Mm. You go to the bank. I think it was uh, bank of Nova Scotia, ask the board of their parking lot, invited 10 vendors. Next thing you know, we had a, a farmer's market. The very first day we arrest the guy trafficking crack cocaine as we're cutting the ribbon to open up the market. And uh, one of the officers there goes and makes an arrest and, and nobody was all upset about it. They're saying, okay, well, it doesn't matter. You're not stopping doing what you're doing, right? You're still opening a farmer's market while continuing your police work. It wasn't about whether or not that would be successful. For us, it was about whether or not we could try and show that community people cared about them. And that's really what it comes down to. Do you care or not? And, and, and that means you have to be in it in terms of it's a marathon. It's not a sprint because 
if you think it's just going like you're not going to hit a home run, the game's over and everything's set for life. The neighborhood's going to still have any challenges. The same way every other neighborhood in the sea would have challenges. And uh, I remember the Boys and Girls Club growing up in Centertown, and members of the police were always there playing hockey, playing ball hockey, and playing sports with us. So when we saw a cruiser in the neighborhood, uh, we didn't run. We walked, knew. we knew the officer by his first name, Sergeant Mike, and and. He'd stop by and my dad had played pro baseball and he was a musician. So the community really respected him. And so when he, when Sergeant Mike wanted to get a sort of sense of what's going on in the community, he'd come talk to my dad, but he wouldn't come talk to my dad officer to, uh, to a, a member of the community. He'd sit down and he did, he actually back then. And they did, that's how they did things. He'd sit down and have a beer with my dad yeah, and just chat. And so if we had to get to Jack Purcell community center to go to a dance, we weren't hesitant. Mike would drive us, right? Because yeah. he knew that we were going to be the kids who weren't going to be breaking into places. There's still going to be kids doing that stuff, stealing cars and getting into all kinds of mischief. But it was his way of, there's a big picture marathon, not a sprint of, of, of solving the problem. And, and but, that's but the game. Really? The, ga the game of life is never won by a pinch hitter. No. Right? The game of life is won by a starting pitcher who's able to pitch all nine innings. That's what it comes down to. Those pinch hitters are for a different game called baseball. You know, and I, when I worked in a place called Kimberwood, 500 people, little Inuit community on South Baffin Island, and I went house to house every day of the week and had tea with people. I used to joke that the only thing I had more of the use than tea was toilets because I go have tea house to house to house. After a few months, kids never committed crimes in that community because Vern came to visit their parents all the time. That's it. So, so I, I, I would have no crime rate at all. Now I'd go away for three weeks on holidays, home to Cape Breton, and there'd be That's a couple of break and enters and, and the officer there would be crazy the whole three weeks. And yeah. when I got back, when I got back, of course they'd announce I'm back in town, not because they were afraid of me, the opposite. Yeah. They were afraid that I would come and talk to their dad and talk about how I felt they were disrespecting the rules of the community. These laws aren't my laws, they're our yeah. laws. For two years I did that. It was there in that community and I, I loved every second of it. And I still have relationships with people from that community from 1991. Still have relationships with people from that community, not because I was a hard ass cop, to be honest, yeah. but because I cared, right? I mean, I cared about their life and my life. So that, now you've taken on a new role and you're with Syntax Strategic now. As a yeah, I'm doing some consulting with them, yeah. Okay. Um, Great resource for them. It made sense for them to bring you on to tap into all the information and ever the value you can bring to the table for them. And uh, you wrote a really interesting blog article, and, and essentially it was the coronavirus pandemic and the test of leadership. And anybody can lean on a good day. It's when crap's hitting the fan when you really sort of get a chance to show your stuff. And uh, I really enjoyed the blog, and I'm going to post it on my Facebook page stuff, but. What I really liked was the fact that oftentimes as a leader, we look at other leaders and we want to copy them. And that's almost like going in and trying to play hockey and say, I'm going to, I'm going to mimic Wayne Gretzky. Or you can't yeah. do it. In the same no. way, Wayne Gretzky couldn't be Scotty Bowman because Wayne would do things that naturally came to him, but he, the other guys couldn't do it. It was Wayne's normal. Yeah. So when I, I read your article and, you know, uh, you have to be agile. You have to be able to adjust as a leader. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, the margin for error is small. And if you want to build any credit with the audience that, that you're connected to, you absolutely have to be authentic and offer as much transparency as you can. You can't give away state secrets, but at the same time, uh, be transparent and authentic because when you do have, you, when you have to share a crap sandwich to people, it's not appetizing, but at least they understand why it's being served. Yeah. You, you know, it's uh, the, the, uh, I've heard a lot of police leaders who get up in front of a camera and the media will say, well, what about, I can't tell you that. The yeah. truth is, what you should say is, I can't tell you that because that might be evidentiary. Mm -hmm. And the only person who knows that is the person who committed the crime. And when they tell us, we want to make sure that they're the person who committed the crime. Like, yeah. be, be frank and honest. I remember, God bless him, Max Keeping one time. We had charged someone with uh, or arrested somebody for uh, an offense in the city and Max was interviewing me in front of the uh, in front of the station and mm -hmm. said well, can you give us the name of the offender and I said no we haven't laid charges yet. and Max says well we have a right to know and I said no you don't Max you have a lot of rights in this country but the right to know is not one of them 
when yeah. you should know, when I can tell you, I will tell you. But until that point, you don't have a right to know. Yeah. And I remember Max afterwards saying, my God, usually they'd say no comment. And I'd say, well, look, no comment's not an answer. Give an answer, a plausible, real answer. Yeah. Don't lie to them. Tell them why you can or can't tell them what they're asking. And then move on. The public's not different than that. I remember a lady complaining one time that we hadn't patrolled her street. I was on when I was on Ask the Chief, her street often enough. And I asked her why. And she said, Well, I pay taxes like everyone else. I said, We don't patrol your street because there's never any crime on it. You should be demanding that we are where the crime is. Yeah. You know, the fact that we don't drive up and down your street, you should be bragging to your neighbors about the fact that cops never have to be here because we have no crime. I could have easily said, I'll send a car there on Thursday night just to yeah. drive by, but that's not true. It's not, it's yeah. not, and it's not valuable and helpful. And if she can't trust, I'll be honest with her and a good question. How can she trust when it's a bad day? Yeah, and you know, back to the, 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 the you, if you would have went no comment with Max, then you're, the implication is you're, you have information that you don't want to share. Yeah, that's so right. We have, we may have information, but this is not the forum for us to share. Yeah, right? exactly. Now, you had a quote in that, that blog. It says, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead to where there is no path and leave a trail. Has that sort of been your MO? I know it's part of the blog, but has that sort of been your approach as well? From a, uh, You want to walk away knowing that in that gig, as a chief, uh, Senate, a consultant, you wake up in the morning and subconsciously, I think we all ask ourselves in one way or another, are we in our right place in our right time? Is what we're doing right now, does that suit fit us? And can we can we live the day with that suit on? And uh, if you're in the right time, the right place, then, then a crappy day is still a pretty good day. Yeah, you know, you know, if you, if you go back to your football days, if, if there were only four plays, yeah, how would you ever win a game? The reason yeah. you bring in new plays is so that you can run a route nobody else can run. You can run one that nobody can defend. Yeah. But you can one run that run one that only you and the quarterback know you guys can hit every time, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to set your own place in, in stone. When I was in uh, Nunavut as the commanding officer, we had difficulty hiring Inuit officers into the force. Uh, a number of reasons. One was because about 55% uh, had difficulty with the eye exam. They were myopic can be fixed by laser eye surgery. In fact, we started sending people to Montreal to have their eyes lasered, uh, even though nobody had talked about it previously. And secondly, they were having difficulty with the exam. So we instituted English second language training for Inuit applicants. Right. Now, nobody ever said you couldn't do that, but nobody ever wrote it in the policy that you should do that. So nobody did it. So as a result, we hired, I think, one or two Inuit officers over a 10 year period. We'd hired 16 in 14 months after that. Not, and, and almost every one of them, because we had decided that we weren't going to accept those two barriers. We weren't going to lower the standards, yeah. but we weren't going to accept those two barriers. Instead, we were going to find a way to help people and give people the tools to climb over those barriers. English second language training, we were doing it for new Canadians, but not first Canadians. That doesn't make sense. Laser eye surgery, I could go as a police officer and get my eyes lasered. I could go as a 17-year-old and get them lasered and join the police service. Well, yeah. why wouldn't we help them access those tools? So we started helping them access those tools in Montreal. So I just think all of us look for not only our own mark, make our own mark. I mean, I think every carpenter, everybody I know in policing, every football player, every athlete I've ever known, no, it wants to be known for something they do different than everybody else. Right. Sure, they want to be Wayne Gretzky, but they want to be Wayne Gretzky with an edge maybe, right? They want to have that thing that nobody else is showing. Mm. So I think we all innately have that in us. It's difficult in my job in the Senate, to be fair, or it's difficult in any other consulting work I do because you're often working with other, other moving parts that you don't control. Politics is a huge one. You don't control all those moving parts. So it's not always as easy. So instead, you try to find something else that you can do to, to help become your own moving part, I guess. But then you, you, you still have to really care, for one, because you can end up in, in, in Nunavut, you can end up way north and slowly go, Man, nobody cares, why should I care? But you have to care to want to challenge the status quo to solve problems differently. You do, look, when I, when I was in Kimroot, uh, 500 people, I told you I'd go house yeah. to house. I'd, 
I decided that one year that uh, we were going to have a turkey dinner for Christmas. A whole community of 500 was going to have turkey dinner in the gymnasium. Now, right. It wasn't very common to have turkey dinner. So I made a deal that I would do everybody's income tax. I would print it out on this computer I had. Yeah. They would submit it. They all had to put $10 into the turkey box. And I ordered 22 or 24 turkeys that September yeah. on a barge. And we had a huge turkey dinner at Christmas time. Now, the next year I left, I transferred out and they were all upset because the new RCMP guy wouldn't, wouldn't do their income tax yeah. and wouldn't bring in turkeys. But I still wanted to be the guy who brought turkeys in for Christmas dinner, even though it had no policing connection. It yeah. had a connection to community. I mean, they talked about it from Christmas right till that summer about everybody sitting around eating turkey and dinner. And they didn't realize the stuffing came out of the inside of that turkey and things like that that you just want it to be different than everybody else. I think we go through life not wanting to be the same as everybody else for the most part, no. but standing out. Right? We want to stand out just a little bit. I think by, by becoming someone else and adopting someone else's life template, you end up missing out on your own opportunities. To I agree. Do things that, you know, life's about stories. And I, I can't tell you a score of a football game I played that's probably part of the reason why I'm donating my brain to play. <laughs> but I can tell you about the athletes, the teammates, the coaches, the people I met along the way. It's almost as if it happened yesterday. And I'm sure they're still talking about that Christmas turkey dinner. And and and, and they may have said, you know, that that Vern White, he was a bit of a different cat. And 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 to, oftentimes it takes a different cat to capture the room. Yeah, no, I think it does. I, and back to the being authentic, you know, we go back to the drug treatment center piece. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I think at that time, it would have been very easy for some people to be very upset because I was drawing attention to a very negative thing in a city that everyone loves to live in by calling it the crack capital or whatever else I would say. Yeah, and it's easy to uh, write them off. It's easy to I, write them off, right? Absolutely. So until you start painting the picture of why it's important, yeah. You know, we like I said, every high school in the city have a, has a connection now to a drug treatment counselor. We're the only city in the country that has that because of STEPS, poor treatment education prevention. Because of that program, it's not even something I thought about. Somebody else actually brought that into the room after we were chasing drug treatment centers, saying, well, if we're getting people who fall through cracks in the floor, how about if we fill in a few of the cracks by connecting with people in grade nine and 10? <laughs> Great idea. I never thought of that. Yeah. So it's not even about owning it yourself. Sometimes it's about starting to build something and everyone else comes in and says, Oh, let me, let me do some of the work on it. I'll tell you, Ken, yeah. you never threw the ball to yourself once, did you? Never. Right. So mm -hmm. that's exactly it. And, and uh, the interesting thing too, is that the real value I've learned isn't from getting to the destination. It has everything to do with, what it took to get there it's a journey eh? because uh there's no straight arrow line to you know solving the problem there's uh there's peaks and valleys there's ebbs and flows mm -hmm. there's all kinds of stuff where you have to uh figure out ways uh, to adapt and and i think that's leadership and coaching figure out ways okay the situation is almost like again boxing guy throws a punch okay that's his punch i got to counter it and in life, as long, if you can counter punches and be in a position where uh, you can problem solve along the way, you're going to put yourself in a pretty good position. If, and if leaders can do that, and if they can tell their team, uh, we're going to solve the problem and walk out the room, they're going to say, what the heck was that? But if they say, we're going to solve the problem, and this is how we're going to do it. This is why we're going to do it. This is where we're going to do it. This is when and who's going to do the job. Then, it, then you just turn that mountain to a molehill. And now you've got some, some sort of clarity and vision to say, okay, let's go after this. This is possible. This drug treatment center is possible. Major issues that connect with the community up north, it's possible, right? It's just about your approach. No, you look at COVID-19 right now, and it's what I wrote yeah. in the article there about, as Churchill talked about, finest hour, right? I mean, I think we are seeing some of Canada's uh, some people in Canada who weren't necessarily seen as leaders previously, and you look at, uh, you know, some of Dr. Tam or, yeah. or the doctor, the medical health officer in British Columbia and other provinces in Nova Scotia, Dr. String. I think we're seeing them in their finest hour right now. You know, it, it's, it's not that they 
didn't matter before. I'm sure they matter greatly to a very small sliver of society, but today they matter to all of us. So I think now is that time where, you know, somebody else on the team gets a chance to actually stand out and hopefully get us through this in, in their finest hour, right? And, and get us to a place, um, you know, we're, we're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of people die in this country and hundreds of thousands of die or more worldwide. Our goal, I think, is uh, not dissimilar regardless of what country we're in right now. I think so now it's time for some other people to have their finest hour. And I think that's what we're seeing with some folks who are stepping forward right now. And God bless them, because um, I think I think without them, we would be in much even more trouble than we are in. Yeah, I think that information that's being shared allows us to say, okay, let's look at the problem and solve the problem. Let's not panic. It's almost like that Apollo 13 moment. Okay, guys, what works on the ship? Let's yeah. solve the problem. And uh, it reminds me of how people are reacting today and how Canadians have been very poised for the most part uh, about what we're dealing with today with the coronavirus. And I harken back to when we had our blackout here in the city. And I was down the market and the power went out. And we thought, okay, 2004, right? Okay. Eh? Yeah. And the thought was, okay, immediately we started thinking of looters. And, and the only reference we had was maybe something that happened in the States. And I was immensely proud of the city and how everybody reacted because uh, the very first thing was, okay, let's figure out what's going on and, and solve that problem versus manufacturing a bunch of problems that keeps us away from trying to solve the actual problem we should be dealing with. Yeah, I think we're lucky as Canadians as well. Um, you know, how many people have, um, going through this, how many people have stepped out to help neighbors, that caring and sharing piece that they're talking about. I think that's very Canadian of us. I think uh, you're not wrong when, when something happens here, if we don't have that experience, we try to see who else has had it and yeah. how they dealt with it. And I think it's not always positive that we look to other countries. And, you know, I know they've had some looting in some of the major cities in the U.S. already, and we haven't had any of that here. I think, uh, Canadians, for the most part, want to understand and take the right steps forward. You know, today I was out for a run, and as an example, and as you're running down the sidewalk, you're 500 meters away from somebody coming towards you, and you're trying to decide which of you should cross the road, because one of you are crossing that road, and you'll not have to tell the other to do it. In fact, the worst case scenario, you both end up in the middle of the road trying to figure this out. I think that's a Canadian way, right? We look for solutions. And makes me very proud to be Canadian. I, I, uh, I can't think of any other country that can get through this better than we can, as yeah. difficult as it's going to be. Well, the good news is I think globally, uh, people recognize that Canada will be poised and problem solve. Uh, the key for anybody looking at Canada as a nation and how we behave and how we navigate challenging times is just do not touch our goalie. Don't you touch the goalie. goalie <laughs> It's a garage sale. Just don't touch the goalie. That's we, have a, we have a biological flaw. And it's on our <laughs> touch our goalie. It's on. Yeah. yeah. No, no. The, 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 the bench is empty. <laughs> hey, Vern, thank you so much. I appreciate well, Thank you very much for having me, Ken. It's always yeah. great to talk to you. And for those who are watching, and, and we got uh, we got a great roster of speakers that we're going to connect with, including our next one on Friday, the 17th, and it'll be uh, Ray Zahab. And he's an adventurer, an ultra marathoner, long distance. Spectacular runner. runner, yeah. He's a fantastic guy. And talk about a guy who changed his life uh, from being a chain smoker to a guy who decided to go see the world. And uh, I'm really excited about talking to him. <sighs> Speaking with you makes that experience anticlimactic, but at the same time, uh, really grateful for you to make time, Bern. I, I appreciate it, and, and keep this family safe and keep them well. You too. God bless. Take care.